Prisons are scary places, right? Our news and media are full of stories about the violence and depravity that the people behind bars are made to face. However, some prisons are worse than others, and today we're going to talk about one of the most infamous in history, an inescapable island fortress whose reputation is almost mythological. The Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. Hi, it's me, Oz, and welcome back to another episode of the Past Pass. I'm your local floor goblin, and I'm here to use my aluminum bat and take out your kneecaps and bring you down to my level so I can regale you with interesting facts and information. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about Alcatraz today. From the escape attempts to its reputation and eventual shutdown. Today's episode will have violence mentioned, so if you find that upsetting, please watch a different one of our videos instead. For those of you sticking around though, let's get right into this. Super quick, I've actually been to Alcatraz. It was pretty poggers. Um, kind of spooky, but yeah, it, it's actually a really cool place. Nowadays, it's a pain in the ass to get a ticket to, but hey, if you can, it is definitely worth the time. Now, starting off with the history behind Alcatraz, the island of Alcatraz came under American control at the end of the Mexican-American War in 1848. As soon as the U.S. acquired the island, military leaders immediately recognized how valuable it was. In fact, an 1856 report from the Pacific Board of Engineers reads, the most prominent position of this secondary line is Alcatraz Island. Its guns sweep a large expanse of waters than those of any other point. And at the time, California's gold rush was beginning, and the army knew that Alcatraz was an important part of protecting the San Francisco Bay Area. In the book Alcatraz, History and Design of a Landmark, authors Donald McDonald nice, and Ira Nadel describe the government's plan on fortifying the island. In April 1849, a joint Army-Navy commission met to recommend defensive measures for the bay, and on November 1, 1850, they announced their plan. Beginning with construction of two masonry forts at the narrowest part of entry, one at Lime Point on the northern marine shore and the other at Four Point on the south bay shore where a Spanish battery once stood, the two forts could concentrate cannon fire on any invading force. Its potential firepower could cover not only the outer batteries to the west, but also the entire harbor between Angel Island to the north and San Francisco to the south. And while Alcatraz wouldn't be used as a federal penitentiary until 1934, the island's potential of housing dangerous criminals was realized all the way back in the 1850s. The Civil War created even more use for the military prison. Many soldiers who were charged with treason found themselves serving their sentence inside the tiny and inhumane cells in the old prison. Political and military prisoners alike were held on the inhospitable island for years, and some of them were put to work building a new prison on the island in 1909. This new development would later become known as The Rock. As Alcatraz began to see more and more use by the government, the entire island started to change. Author Gregory Wellman describes the rapid growth and development that Alcatraz went through during the 19th century. Throughout the 1800s, the island evolved, and by the 1890s, the island had transformed drastically. Bustling with military personnel and a growing prison population, the island was a small city in the bay. During the 1890s, the Alcatraz population would skyrocket because of the Spanish-American War, creating a need for more modern structures, one of which was a fully functional hospital, finally built in during the late 19th century. Five years later, the hospital would be essential in providing medical care for the growing military and prison population. By 1907, Alcatraz was no longer needed as a military outpost. The prison was officially designated as Pacific Branch U.S. Military Prison Alcatraz Island, and the soldiers who were guarding the inmates were replaced with official military prison guards. That same year, Colonel Reuben Turner was tasked with designing a new, state-of-the-art prison on Alcatraz Island. With a budget of $250,000, Turner put his inmates to work building the rock. Now, I decided to put that number through an inflation calculator, and we would probably be looking at somewhere between seven to eight million dollars dedicated to building this prison. Just thought I would share that with you all. Now, one interesting anecdote from this time in Alcatraz's history is the story of the Friday night fights hosted by the military. These were sanctioned boxing matches between inmates that the public could buy tickets to. Plus, at the end of the night, there would be a battle royale match where a bunch of prisoners would be blindfolded and thrown into the ring to fight all at once. Holy shit. That's right. The U.S. military was running their own coliseum within the eyesight of San Francisco. 
Luckily for the prisoners, no lions were involved, but that would have been kind of cool. I mean, the zoo was just down the road in about 20 years or so, but still, my, my, my point stands. Anyways, crimes against humanity aside, let's take a look at the post-Federal Bureau of Prisons takeover. Now, Alcatraz Island served as a military prison for almost a century, but in 1933, it was transformed. Oh, so they could have gotten lions from the zoo. Nice. Anyways, in 1933, it was transferred to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Gregory Wellman details why the transfer occurred. One of the most important reasons for the transfers was the bad publicity the military received by having a prison in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Prone to the occasional escape attempt, Alcatraz was covered regularly by the press. Along with the ever-growing upkeep costs, Alcatraz was losing its allure for the military. The second important reason was the Federal Bureau of Prisons' interest in Alcatraz. The 1930s prison system in America was feeling the repercussions of the Roaring Twenties, with the rise in prison population from the flood of arrests of gangsters and bootleggers. With the rise, the Federal Bureau of Prisons was in need of a more, um, how you say, elaborate prison. The concept of a new, maximum security prison was introduced to thwart escapes and to hold the worst of the worst in America's inmate population. Alcatraz would provide the perfect outlet for the Bureau's new experiment. After being made into a federal prison, Alcatraz quickly gained a notorious reputation. Designed as the first supermax prison in America, Alcatraz was unlike any of the penitentiaries that came before it. One U.S. Attorney General flat out said that rehabilitation wasn't the goal for inmates on the island. He described Alcatraz as the ultimate punishment society could inflict upon men short of killing them. The point of no return for multiple losers. Another writer called Alcatraz the Great Garbage Can of San Francisco Bay, into which every federal prison dumped its most rotten apples. Because its purpose was to house the worst of the worst, the security on Alcatraz was incredibly overbearing. Apparently, just being located on an island wasn't enough. When the Federal Bureau of Prisons took over Alcatraz in 1933, they upgraded almost all of the security measures. Four new guard towers were built at key points around the island. 336 cells were upgraded with tool-proof steel and remote locking devices. The gun galleries were built so that the guards armed with machine guns could watch over the inmates at all times. Plus, the mess hall and main entrances were outfitted with remote activated tear gas canisters that could be triggered from the gun galleries. In short, there was nothing overlooked when it came to keeping the inmates under control. And let's not forget that even beyond the amped up security measures, Alcatraz is still an island. Even if you somehow manage to break out, there's almost no chance of escaping. But more on that one later. Attorney General Cummings was quoted by the New York Times in 1933 after the island was transferred to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I'm just gonna call it the FBP for now on. The current surrounding the island is swift and escapes are practically impossible. It has secure cells for 600 persons. It is in excellent condition and admirably fitted for the purposes I had in mind. Here may be the isolated criminals of vicious and irredeemable types, so that their evil influences may not be extended to other prisoners who are disposed to rehabilitate themselves. Now, you might be thinking, what kind of people are so bad that normal prisons aren't secure enough to house them? Was building an island prison fortress at sea really necessary? Let's take a look at some of the most infamous guests at Alcatraz, and perhaps their actions will speak for themselves. Even if you entered Alcatraz mentally stable, spending time behind bars on Alcatraz Island could have devastating effects on your psyche. Attorney General Frank Murphy had this to say about the prison's environment. The whole institution is conductive to psychology that builds up a sinister and vicious attitude among the prisoners. Alcatraz's most infamous inmate didn't need any help becoming a lunatic, though. Robert Stroud, a.k.a. the Birdman of Alcatraz, already had a few screws loose when he first set foot on the rock. Stroud was born in 1890 in Seattle. He ran away from his abusive home when he was 13 and learned how to survive on the streets. And by the time that he was 18 years old, Stroud had become a pimp. Kitty O'Brien was one of Stroud's prostitutes, a woman twice his age. Kitty was also some sort of a mother figure for Stroud. In January of 1909, an ex-lover ruthlessly beat Kitty. 
A New York Times article describes the incident and what Stroud did in retaliation. She was lying on their bed groaning. Both her eyes were blackened and there was a red line on her neck. Stroud was a mother's boy who hated his father because he had beaten him and beaten his mother. Kitty O'Brien was his first, last, and only love. Charlie Dahmer, a former lover of Kitty's, had beaten her up because she wouldn't return to live with him. He had taken Kitty's locket, which contained a picture of her daughter. Now, when Dahmer returned to his room at 6.30 the next morning, he found Stroud waiting for him. He grabbed Stroud by the neck. Stroud, though, fired his 38 revolver and missed. He fired again, but this time, hit. Dahmer still coming at him. Stroud slammed the gun against his head, and Dahmer slumped, dead from the second shot. Stroud was immediately arrested, found guilty of manslaughter, and sentenced to 12 years for killing Dahmer. As soon as he was locked up, Stroud gained a reputation for being violent. He stabbed one inmate who snitched about Stroud stealing food, attacked an orderly who reported him for threats, and stabbed another prisoner during a narcotic smuggling attempt. Stroud eventually got transferred to Leavenworth, Kansas for using people as pincushions one too many times. It was at this prison that he would commit his second murder, but this time, his target was a guard. This strangely biased New York Times article reported the crime. Stroud had words with a prison guard named Andrew F. Turner, a bully, probably a sadist. I, 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 it does seem a little strange the Times would print this random conjecture that Turner was a sadist. Anyways, I, I continue. And a man fairly typical of the caliber of the prison guards of that day. He had thrashed a friend of Stroud's and also reported Stroud for a minor infraction of a prison rule, which cost him seeing his brother. Stroud and Turner again had words. Turner raised his club and Stroud seized it with his right hand. With his left hand, he thrust a knife into Turner's chest. Turner died instantly. Now, we actually have access to part of a letter that Stroud wrote to his mom about the stabbing. In the letter, he tells his mother that Turner died of heart failure, which, I mean, it, it's technically true, but I, I mean, if your heart has a knife sticking out of it, it it's probably gonna fail. Now, here's an excerpt of this horribly misspelled letter. Sunday, March 26, at the noon meal, I got up from the table and walked up the aisle to where a guard was standing and started to walk to him. We talked very quietly and stood very close together, but anyone looking at our faces could see that our words must be very intense. We all at once break away from each other, and the guard reaching for his club, which was under his left arm, with his right hand and myself making a very quick movement, with my left hand, which had been at my side. When we both stepped back, the guard seemed to be sick. He caught at the table behind him, staggered a little and slipped to the floor. He died shortly afterwards of heart failure. The unintelligible word seems to hold that his heart was all right before I made that move with my left hand. It wasn't, and I will have to prove that when I go to trial. When they give the dead guard the once-over, they found that he had a dagger wound about six inches deep that passed through his heart. Likely story. So, stabbing people to death is one thing, but how did Stroud earn his Birdman nickname? Well, that's actually pretty simple. One day he found a nest of three injured sparrows in the prison yard. This rescue sparked a passion for ornithology. This made Stroud spend the next two decades raising and studying birds. He even developed new cures for diseases that affect canaries. Stroud eventually published two books, Diseases of Canaries in 1933 and Stroud's Digest of the Diseases of Birds in 1943. Stroud even had a book and movie made about him, The Birdman of Alcatraz, starring Burt Lancaster as Stroud, which was released in 1962. But according to one former Alcatraz guard, the movie wasn't a very accurate depiction. And Birdman of Alcatraz about Robert Stroud, that guy was not a sweetheart. He was a vicious killer. I think Burt Lancaster owes us all an apology. Stroud was transferred to Alcatraz in 1941, and although his nickname is the Birdman of Alcatraz, he wasn't allowed to care for birds there like he had at Leavenworth. The Birdman spent his first six years on the rock in solitary confinement, then the last 11 in the hospital wing. Alcatraz housed plenty of famous criminals, including famous gangsters like Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly. And uh, not the Machine Gun Kelly who got roasted by Eminem. But none of them came close to being as interesting and enigmatic as Robert Stroud. The Birdman is definitely one of the more interesting prisoners who has an interesting tale behind him, as fabricated as it may be.
Now, there are a lot of historical events surrounding the rock as well. Some of you may be familiar with a little something known as the Battle of Alcatraz. Even if your prison is marketed as the most inescapable in the world, inmates are still going to try and make a break for it. Plus, the Count of Monte Cristo taught us that even island fortresses can be escaped if given enough time. Over the course of its 29 years as a federal prison, Alcatraz experienced 14 escape attempts. We don't have time to break them all down, so let's just talk about the two most infamous of them. First up is the notorious Battle of Alcatraz. This one took place in 1946 from May 2nd to the 4th. Six inmates staged a takeover and escape attempt that would end with three deaths and over a dozen injured. Here's what happened. Bernard Coy was the leader of the group attempting the escape. He spent all of his time studying how the prison worked, looking for holes in the security measures. Coy noticed that the bars guarding the gun gallery could probably be pried open, so he spent the next few weeks losing 20 pounds of weight in order to more easily reach the weapons inside. The plan was set in motion, when Bernard Coy and Marvin Hubbard attacked a lone guard and stole his keys. The two then released accomplices Joseph Kretzer and Clarence Carnes from their cells before making their way to the gun gallery. Coy pried open the bars to the gallery and retrieved a rifle, pistol, clubs, and gas grenades to use for the escape. Now armed to the teeth, Coy and the others used their weapons to force another guard to release more prisoners. The two guards were taken hostage and then locked into a cell in the C block. The plan was to exit the prison and reach the docks to escape, but this ill-fated gang of prison breakers never made it that far. After trying the wrong keys for the cell block that they were in, the inmates accidentally broke the lock, leaving them stranded inside the building with their hostages. Now, more unwitting guards entered the cell block and were taken hostage by the inmates. By this time, nine officers were being held in the cells. Coy and the others realized that their original plan had failed, so they had decided to try and shoot their way out of the situation. Coy shot at guards and watchtowers and hit one of them. Around this time, Shockley and Thompson, more accomplices, had convinced Kretzer to murder the guards they had taken hostage. Kretzer opened fire, killing one guard and injuring four others. Another group of officers attempted to breach the gun cage where the convicts were held up. A gunfight ensued and one officer was killed by friendly fire. The prison officials decided then to cut off the power and wait for nightfall before making another attempt at stamping out the uprising. The Marines were brought in that night to use military tactics against the inmates. They cut holes into the roof of the prison and started dropping grenades inside, forcing the convicts into a corridor where they would be trapped. The battle would ensue, killing two Alcatraz guards and wounding 13 others in a bid for freedom. Prison officials estimated their cache of ammunition was virtually exhausted after a besiege lasting nearly 30 hours. After a night full of gunfire and bombing, officers found Kretzer, Coy, and Hubbard dead at 9.40 a.m. on May the 4th. Marion Thompson and Sam Shockley survived the initial battle, but were both eventually executed for their involvement. Now, we're going to move forward to one of the more, should I say, infamous stories involving Alcatraz. The second prison break we're going to be talking about today is the 1962 attempt made by Clarence and John Anglin. The Anglin brothers, along with their co-conspirator Frank Morris, hatched one of the most ingenious prison break plans of all time. Okay, well, we, we don't actually know how good the plan it was because we still don't know what happened to the three escapees. So, how do you escape the most tightly guarded prison in America? Well. First of all, you'll need a lot of time. Morris and the Anglins spent over seven months preparing for the break. And that time they created a secret workshop on top of their cell block where they could gather and work on materials they needed for the escape. One of the more important obstacles to overcome was the problem of actually escaping the island. Getting out of the prison walls was one thing, getting off the island was another. The prisoners stole over 50 raincoats and turned them into life preservers and a raft to help them survive the trip to the shore. Their destination was Angel Island, located one mile away from Alcatraz. And while it is possible to swim this distance, the odds of them making it across the frigid water without help are slim. It was important for the convicts to keep their disappearance a secret for as long as possible. If the guards discovered they were missing too quickly, the whole plan would fall apart. They knew that the guards would check their cells at night, so they built dummy heads out of plaster, paint, and real hair to fool them. No one knew that the Anglin brothers and Morris were gone until the next morning, 
And by that time, the three men were long gone. An article published the day after their escape reads in part, Sometime during the night, they squeezed through the widened apertures they had cut in the wall, emerging into utility alleyway between cell blocks. In the clear view of a gun tower, they stole across the roof and then descended a wall by sliding down a kitchen vent pipe about 50 feet to the ground. The wall was brightly illuminated by a searchlight. Warden Olin G. Blackwell, who abandoned a fishing trip to return to the prison, was asked if the men might still be on the island. I don't know. I just don't know, he said. Now, I get that these are convicted criminals we're talking about, but there's still something inherently cool about breaking out of a Supermax prison, especially if that Supermax is also located in the middle of an ocean. A massive search was conducted over the next 10 days. The authorities scoured the entire area over land, sea, and air, but no conclusive evidence of what happened was ever found. No one is really sure if their escape attempt was successful or not. And of course, people have reported sightings of these escapees over the years, but so far, no leads have ever panned out. Although, in 2018, CBS published a letter that was supposedly written by John Anglin. It reads, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. So, who's to say what happened that night? The truth is that no one knows the truth. The Anglin brothers and Frank Morris are like the D.B. Coopers of the prison break scene. Which, by the way, when you actually go and visit Alcatraz, they do have the little styrofoam plaster heads that they used for the escape, and you can see the walls they went through. They've gone and they've cut like a giant hole and put a glass pane so you can see the utility um, hallway between the two cells they climbed through. It's, it's crazy. I, I, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Now, just one year after the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris escaped, Alcatraz was shut down. Contrary to what some believe, their escape had nothing to do with the prison closing. Like most things, it all came down to money. See, Alcatraz was an insanely expensive prison to run. In fact, the cost of keeping an offender at Alcatraz was three times as high as it was to stay in any other federal prison. It was estimated at the time that Alcatraz needed up to five million for restoration and maintenance alone which in today's money is about $45 million. Now, since it was located on an island, everything had to be shipped to the prison, including water. Almost 1 million gallons of fresh water was brought in every week on barges. The cost of running an island prison just wasn't feasible in the long run. The New York Times eulogized the prison as so. The federal prison on Alcatraz Island became a hollow echoing shell today with the removal of the last 27 prisoners. After nearly 29 years in the federal prison system and 54 years of exposure, Alcatraz has almost succumbed to the salt air that blows through the Golden Gate. Today's removal of the last prisoners was not announced until midway through a mass tour for newsmen. After the tour was ended, the prisoners were led to a lodge, taken to the Alcatraz dock in a slip at Fort Nathan at the tip of the San Francisco Peninsula. When the launch had cleared the slip on the island, the guard whose station was in the tower overlooking the slip came down. Alcatraz was no longer a prison. Families of the guards stood on the balconies of the old apartment building and watched. Some of the women appeared to be weeping tears from their eyes. Although there were no echoes of it today, except in the minds and memory, Alcatraz has upon occasion been a place of great violence. It has always been called escape proof and federal officials still insist that death by drowning overtook those prisoners who broke out and were never heard from again. Alcatraz Island was pretty much abandoned after the prison closed. Different groups proposed ideas for new uses for the island. Some of these included a monument for the United Nations, a West Coast Statue of Liberty type structure, and a shopping mall. Ultimately though, the island was handed over to the National Park Service after Congress included it in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Today, Alcatraz is nothing more than a creepy museum that you can visit by boat. What was once the scariest prison in America is now just another tourist attraction. You can even buy replica cups and food trays from the online shop to complete your inmate cosplay. Anyways, that concludes today's episode of Thinkology. Thank you all for checking out this interesting history of Alcatraz. If you like and subscribe, I might consider giving you your kneecaps back. And anyways, I'm Oz. It's been great informing you all on this uh, accursed island that, you know, Apparently held 
fight nights that didn't have lions. I'm very disappointed about that. But anyways, this has been Oz. Thanks for watching this episode. Like, subscribe, and do all that jazz, and I'll see you all next time. Ooh.